Ephesians. Well, as you know, we're going through Ephesians, um, and we're in chapter 1 of Ephesians, and from time to time we'll probably stop and just have a look at something a bit more in detail, kind of a theological topic. And we've come to one of those places where I think it would be good to stop and just have a look at it, at it a little bit more in detail, and it's come out of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, where it says here that we who um, have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Uh, and in there he's referring to the providence of God. And so that's the, the title of a message this morning is God's providence or God's providence at work. And so we really want to just see how that all happens and how it comes about. I don't know if you've read a book called Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. Has anyone read that? If you haven't read that, I would recommend that. It's a fantastic book. Um, but in this book, maybe as a little teaser for you to get it and read it, he says this, In the year 1902, a young English boy came down to breakfast to find his father reading the newspaper, which carried news of preparations for the first coronation in Britain in 64 years. In the middle of breakfast, the father turned to his wife and said, Oh, I am sorry to see this worded like that. She said, what is it? Why, he replied, here is a proclamation that on a certain date, Prince Edward will be crowned king at Westminster and there is no Deo Valente, God willing. The word struck in the young boy's mind for the very reason that on the appointed date, the future Edward VII was ill with appendicitis and the coronation had to be postponed. At this time, at the end of Queen Victoria's reign, the political, economic, and military power of the British Empire was at its zenith. Yet for all its great might, Great Britain could not carry out its planned coronation on the appointed date. End quote. While the best laid plans of kings and queens can fail, God's plans cannot. And the reason for this is because God is sovereign. Sovereignty in relation to God means his absolute rule and authority over all things. Unlike our present King Charles III, whose position as the sovereign of the Commonwealth of Nations is really just a symbolic position, it has no real power, divine omnipotence and divine right as creator stand behind God's rule. As Job said to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Likewise, King Nebuchadnezzar said, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but God does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can warn off his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is able to do all that he has planned according to his holy will. But this is more than just theory. The Bible makes it clear that God has actually a plan and that he is working out that plan even now as we sit here this morning and listen to the word of God. And we've seen this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 12. You see that God's plan has a beginning in eternity past. Verse 4, God chose us in him when before the foundation of the world. For what purpose? That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons. We see God's plan has a central focus. It's the redemption that is in Christ. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. God's plan also has a goal. It is the summing up of all things in Christ. Verse 10, that there is a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. All things will be brought into subjection under the headship of Christ. But not only that, from Ephesians 3 down to 12, we see that God's plan is eternal. Again, it was before the foundation of the world. It has its very beginning in the heart and mind of God before anything else was made or created. We see that God's plan is wise. Uh, in verse, one, uh, verse 11, it says that God works all things after the counsel of his will. Right? What God resolved to do, God is the most wise God. And so everything he does, he does with perfect wisdom and knowledge and understanding. 
We see that God's plan is comprehensive. It includes all things. Again, we see that. God works all things after the counsel of his will. God is going to sum up all things in heaven and on earth under the headship of Christ. We see that God's plan is efficacious. It's going to be accomplished. He's even accomplishing it now. That's the idea of God is working all things together. Or God is working all things. We see then that God's plan is according to his will. We looked at that. There was the kind intention of his will. Remember, there was the mystery of his will. And now we see there's the counsel of his will. This is what God wanted to do. This is what pleased God to do before the foundation of the world in glorifying himself. And finally, we see that God's plan is for his glory. And this is the ultimate purpose of everything that God does. It is for his glory, to put his glory on display. And, and in that, we are most content, in that we are most satisfied and joyful, and in that we are fulfilling the purpose for which God created us. And so it's within this outworking of God's plan that we live and move and have our being. This is our reality. Nothing is happening outside of God's eternal, sovereign, redemptive plan. As one author writes, the biblical view of reality sees it as linear. It is moving from one place to another with a beginning, middle, and an end linking one episode after another towards a purposeful goal. Thus, in the biblical worldview, history is uh, teleological. That that is, it is goal-orientated. It is designed. This, in turn, presupposes a goal-setter, a planner, a designer. This is how stories operate. History is a grand story that requires a transcendent author, end quote. Well, God is that author, is he not? God is that designer. God is that planner. God is that goal setter. But more than that, God is the one who is actively working out his plan. We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. And this word work means to bring something about. It's to work it, to produce it, to bring about an effect. It is God's supernatural power in action. You see it there in verse 20 of chapter 1. Uh, Coming back to verse 19, it says, These are in accordance with the working of the strength of God's might, which he brought about. That's the word. In Christ, when? When he raised him from the dead. So when God raised Christ from the dead, that's his power at work. More than that, you see it in chapter 3 verse 20 Uh, look at verse 19 he says so then you are no longer uh, sorry and know that the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do far more abundantly all that we ask of or think according to the power that works within us so that's God's power producing effect in us to be holy to, to be obedient to his word So here, coming back to verse 11 of chapter 1, it carries this idea of continual activity. God is continually active in bringing about what he has planned in eternity past. This is what God is doing even now. So God has a purpose. He has a plan. He has the power to accomplish that plan, and he's doing it. He's doing it now, and we are included in that. And so at this point, the logical question to ask is, do you know what God's plan is? Do you know how God is accomplishing his plan? And what should your response to it be? What should be your response? Because there is a danger of getting so caught up in the things of this present world, including our own earthly plans, and not realizing that there is something more transcendent that is going on. There is a danger that we can focus more on the temporal rather than the eternal, even though the temporal might be essential to life. For example, look with me in in Matthew chapter 6. In verse 31, Jesus is instructing his disciples not to worry about the essential things of life. 
And so he says, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, or if we were to apply it, the unbelievers eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So you would think that if there's any worthy, worthy, worthwhile pursuit, it is to pursue what to eat, what to drink, how to clothe yourself, shelter and protection to make sure that whatever happens in the future, I'm covered with what money I have, with what resources I have. But Jesus is saying, no, no, don't worry about those things. They're not as important as this, verse 30. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. You focus on what God is calling you to be and do. Everything else God will provide for you. And so there's this eternal plan, this transcendent action that is happening, that we are involved in, that we should be focused on and set our minds upon as we live everyday life. We've already seen from Ephesians 3-12 to that God's plan is to redeem the people for himself in Christ and then to sum up all things in Christ. We're also going to see as we go through the book of Ephesians how we can live that focused life on eternal things. How we can focus on God's eternal plan in the practical, everyday, routine, mundane activities of life. We can parent, we can be husbands and wives, we can be workers, we can be fellow believers, we can do ministry, all with a mindset towards God's eternal plan. And we'll see all of that and we'll get all of that, but for now, I just wanted to take a little closer look at how God is actively working all things to accomplish his plan. And then afterwards look at how we can respond to that. Now I confess that what makes this difficult is, is it's a massive topic. But also, what's included in God's plan is obviously sin. Right? The, the Bible says God is sovereign over all things, and so all things must have to include evil. It must have to include sin. But the Bible doesn't shy away from addressing this subject, and neither should we. We should look and see what God says about these things and have that same mind view toward it. And as I said, the subject is massive. There's no way you could address it in one sermon or in a dozen sermons. Hundreds of sermons have been preached in this. Hundreds of books have been written about this. But we all as individuals have to come to grips with it, right? We all have to wrestle with the sovereignty of God in our lives because, because God is sovereign over all things that happen in our lives. And so we personally want to come to our own understanding, our own conviction to this matter, and then to flesh it out in our lives. And so with this in mind, I hope to provide at least a biblical framework for us to think about these things, to think about how we can work it out in our lives, to think about how we can pray and meditate over this matter and apply it and and study it even more. Because it's something that we're always going to be growing in until the day the Lord takes us home to be with him in glory. So let's do that. I've heard often, and you probably have too, that Christians will often say God is sovereign. God is in control. God is working all things for good. But then they respond to unfavorable circumstances, difficulty, sinful circumstances, with grumbling and complaining. They'll respond with great anxiety. They may respond with fear or anger rather than humility and everything that proceeds out of humility. Who's guilty of that? We all are, right? And so while we talk of God's sovereignty, we may struggle to flesh it out in our lives. And that could be for a number of reasons. And one of them is not understanding how God's sovereignty how his absolute rule and authority over all things actually operates in the everyday operation and carrying out of life, of our own lives, and our coming and goings, and our going to work, and the circumstances that we face in life. And so when we speak of God's sovereignty and its activity in our lives, we're really speaking of God's providence. 
We're speaking of his continuous action in preserving his creation and guiding it towards his intended purposes. This used to be a common belief within society, especially society that was influenced by Christendom. People used to talk and speak about and believe in the providence of God, that God was governing all things. But when the Enlightenment period came in the 17th and 18th century, it kind of changed the way people thought about God's providence. And you may think, well, what has the 18th and 17th century have to do with me? Well, I want you to listen to this quote and ask yourself, is this how I think about God? Is this how I think about God? Because if this is how you think about God, then the Enlightenment period has a massive influence on your understanding of God. So listen to this quote. The Enlightenment radically altered theology, epistemology, science, and ethics. Its conception of God stripped him of virtually all he has revealed of himself in Scripture. Instead of an equally transcendent and imminent personal God to whom we owe everything, he was regarded merely as an abstract supreme being who dealt with his cosmos and his creatures through impersonal secondary causes. On the one hand, God lost his, mad, his mystery, his otherworldliness, his fearful incomprehensibility. God of classic theism had been domesticated, humanized. On the other hand, however, his providence was no longer direct and specific, but a general sort of passive oversight whereby the laws of nature did the lion's share of the work of maintaining the day-to-day affairs of the universe, end quote. Is this how you view God in the day-to-day affairs of life? That when it comes to the weather, that when it comes to natural disasters, that when it comes to the change of governments, of human tragedies, of sinful actions, or what we would call coincidence or circumstances, that in all of these things, they pretty much kind of run themselves, and that God provides this primarily this kind of hands-off approach to the affairs of the earth. That God's really not involved at all. He's kind of kicked the world into gear and he's just letting it run. Because if you think that way, that's not what the scriptures teach. That's not what the word of God teaches. That is the influence that the Enlightenment period has on Christendom and our thinking. I mentioned last week that J.O. Packer sums up the biblical view of God's providence in this way. It is the unceasing activity of the creator whereby in overflowing bounty and goodwill he upholds his creatures in orderly existence, guides and governs all events, circumstances, and free acts of angels and men and directs everything to its appointed goal for his own glory, end quote. That's God's providence. God is transcendent, yes, but he's imminent in that he is is present with us. He's actively working in our lives and in the affairs of the world, both the great things and the small things, as we shall see, to accomplish his plan and purposes. And that should have a great impact on how we then live our lives, as we'll see. But briefly, and you've got some notes there, and and, uh, as I said I've got some verses in there for you to read and you can look at afterwards and and meditate on these things because obviously we're not going to go to in depth as we can. But I really want to just touch on each of these things and then bring some application to them. So the Bible reveals three aspects to God's providence. First is God's providence as preservation. Okay, God's providence as preservation. And this has to do with God's constant activity in keeping his creation in existence and functioning in accomplishing his redemptive plan and glory. In other words, God holds everything together and keeps it running. If he didn't, it would all fall apart. And so we see that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Speaking of Christ, he says, He's the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. He's upholding things. You also see this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Speaking again of Christ, he says, He is before all things, and in him all things 
hold together. What God creates, he sustains. And he does this through Jesus Christ, the one through whom all things were made and the one through whom all things are held together. Creation has no inherent power of existence. God upholds it by his power. Creation would cease to be if God did not continually will it to exist. Why are the stars held in place? Why do the planets keep their orbits? That, that's not just the laws of physics and science. That's God who created those laws and he's maintaining them. So we can apply this to our life and our well-being. They're in God's hands. Why do you continue to breathe? Why does your heart continue to beat? That's God. That's God willing you to continue to exist in this physical form. And we look forward to the day when God, has, when God takes us to be with him that we'll have that new body and we'll live eternally in the new heavens and the new earth. But right now, God is keeping us alive. We just saw how God in Matthew provides for us what we need daily to sustain our physical bodies. Psalm 91 verse 10, and we kind of looked at this a little bit as we were going through the, the pandemic and the, 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 the fear that was happening with COVID. And in Psalm 190 verse, 191 sorry, verse 10 says this, No evil will before you, nor will any plague come near your tent. And you think, well, Grant, evil has befallen me in my life and I have suffered illness. That's not the point of what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying, because God is in control of all things, it can't happen unless God permits it, unless God allows it, unless God ordains it. Your life is in his hands. That's why the psalmist can be so confident that God cannot allow something to happen because he knows God's in control of all those things. Again, Psalm 139, verse 16, he speaks of, of our days already being numbered. Hundred thirty nine, verse sixteen. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So God created you, He sustained you. And until the day that you fulfill your days on earth and he call you home to glory. And so when we see that, it should encourage us, and, and, and it's not as simply as an overnight thing as we think through it, but it should encourage us to live our life without fear. Fear of what may happen to us. Again, it doesn't mean you live recklessly, but it just means you live confidently in God's sovereign will. Confident that God has your life in his hands. And so that's God's preservation. And it should mean that we should live for his kingdom, pursue evangelism, pursue making disciples, pursue ministry in the church, pursue godliness. Pursue everything that God has given you life for. And second, God's providence is seen in his governance. Now this has to do with God's constant activity and ruling over all things, so that through them he accomplishes his plan for his glory. Let me read that again. God's providence as governance, God governing his creation, has to do with God's constant activity in ruling over all things, so that through them he accomplishes his plan for his glory. So essentially nothing happens within God's creation that's outside of his control, that's outside of his governance, nothing, nothing. We won't have time to go through these verses. That's why I've written them down for you. But listen, nature is within God's control. God talks about he causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the righteous and the wicked. And this is something too that I guess through the enlightenment period and, and, and understanding of science, which I just consider science as, as really just man understanding what God has created, right? Well, we're just discovering what God has created and we're amazed by it. And it should lead us to praise God, but instead it leads us to, to praise ourselves and to think we're all wise. But science has brought us to understand some of the, the natural laws that God has put in place. 
But again, God is upholding those laws. Right? God is sustaining those laws. Uh, Psalm 107 talks about God raising a storm and then calming it. Right? Which is why Jesus, when his disciples, there was a storm raised up, Jesus could calm it because he's in control of nature. He's in control of the wind and the waves. And he's, even as we think about natural disasters, specifically, you know, we think about what's happened in the Hawke's Bay. Was God not in control of that? Was God not in control of the weather? Was he not in control of the rainfall? Did he not create those mountains that, that, that the water ran down and channeled into that valley? Was he not sustaining the properties of water that it would move the way that it did, that the land would move the way that it did? So God was in control of all of that. It wasn't out of his control. It would be a scary thought, wouldn't it be? If anything in all of creation was outside of God's control. So nature is in God's control. Nations, governments are under God's control. There's no government established except by the authority of God. Even good and evil is under God's control. Lamentations 3, 37, 38, I encourage you to go and read that, especially in light of what uh, Carl is preaching in regards to uh, Habakkuk. Because it's, it's in Lamentations, it's, it's, the, it's Jeremiah lamenting what he's seen in regards to the destruction of Jerusalem, which has come about because in Habakkuk, uh, God reveals that he's raising up the Chaldeans to come and bring punishment upon Israel, upon Judah. And he makes an interesting statement where he says, Who can speak and have it happen unless the Lord has first decreed it? Therefore, it does not both good and ill, good and evil, good and bad, come from the mouth of the Lord. So good and evil is under God's control. There's the activity of spiritual forces. Look at Job, what happened with Job and who was involved in that. Even the decisions of men are under God's control. And you know some of the circumstances that our, uh, our, our family is, is, is going through and that we're praying for. And uh, I do often think of this verse um, in Proverbs 21 where it says, That's Psalm. It's terrible, way. Eh? I'm reading that proverb and thinking I've got the wrong verse. But it basically talks about the now let me get it Proverbs 21 says the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord he turns it wherever he wishes so God's in control of the decisions of men even what we would consider random events and outcomes the casting of dice right? Proverbs 16.33 says God even determines that and so really the Bible is trying to give this overall picture to us that just God is in control. He's just so in control. Nothing happens outside of his sovereign will. And reason why that's really communicated is for this. Can you trust a God who's not sovereign? Think about that. Can you trust a God? Can you entrust yourself to God? Think about all the things you experience in life. The good things and the bad things. Could you trust God if he were not sovereign? If he were not in control? Think in 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is what? God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with each temptation provide a way of escape. Listen, how could God do that? How could God be faithful to that? How could God promise you that if he was not sovereign over all things? You see what I'm saying? You couldn't trust that promise of God if God wasn't able to make sure that whatever trial or temptation you were facing, it wasn't so great for you that you would buckle to it, but also that he would provide you the way that you can endure it, to escape it, to stand up under it. And the area of it, um, so even though God is loving, even though He is wise, could you trust Him if He was not in control? Again, in his book, Trusting God, Jerry Bridges, he writes of this In the arena of adversity, the scriptures teach us three essential truths about God 
truths we must first we must believe if we are to trust him in adversity. They are God is completely in control, God is infinite in wisdom, God is perfect in love. Someone has expressed these truths as they relate to us in this way. God in his love always wills what is best for us. In his wisdom, he always knows what is best for us. And in his sovereignty, he has the power to what? To bring it about, end quote. And so God's providence refers to his preservation of all things. It refers to his governance of all things. And, and finally, and, and we're really not going to have enough time to really look at this, it's God's providence as concurrence. God's providence is concurrent. You say, well, what is that? Well, this has to do with God working out his will through human agency, through other people. R.C. Sproul defines it this way, as God working out his will through the actions of human wills without violating the freedom of those human wills. And you see that in perfect play both in Joseph's life and in Jesus' life. Joseph was sold into slavery but as a result of it being sold into slavery, it turned out in God's providence that he brought about salvation for his family and the continuation of God's promise to Abraham that through him, you know, a nation would come and all the earth would be blessed. So Joseph's brothers acted with evil intent. God's intent of Joseph going to Egypt was good intent. And yet Joseph could say, I know that you sent me here, but really it was God that sent me here. So God's will was accomplished through your actions. You're still responsible for your evil and they sought forgiveness. But God led me here. Likewise, we see that in the death of Christ. People acted wickedly out of their own volition and of their own hate for Christ to put him to death. And yet God could say, or Peter could say when he was preaching about this, that it was according to the predetermined plan and purpose of God. You even see the Old Testament prophecies in regards to Christ's crucifixion. God intended for Christ to be crucified by these men. It was the will of God that this would happen so that he could bring about his purposes, his redemption in Christ for all sinners. And yet it required men to willingly carry out God's plan and they did so. But again, the best way to understand all of this is, is to read these accounts. Genesis 45, the life of Joseph. Read uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. You've got it there in your notes. Um, chapter 4, verse 27 to 28. But God working through the wills of others to accomplish his will without violating the will and without being culpable for the evil that they commit. It's a tongue twister. It's a head twister. But, but scripture's really clear in that. So how do we apply all of this? How do we apply this? Well, remember, coming to grips with God's providence is not an overnight thing. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight in your understanding it, nor in how you respond to it is it going to come overnight. You're not going to wake up tomorrow. It would be great if we could, but you're not going to wake up tomorrow and think, and just you know it all and you can apply it all. It's going to be over your life that you're going to come to grips with these things as you face hardships and difficulties and joys or, or as you see other people working through hardships and difficulties and joys. You're going to wrestle with the providence of God. But remembering God's ultimate purpose in all things, right? To bring about his redemptive plan for the glory of his name. Everything is working towards that end, that goal. And everything fits into that. And so you're going to wrestle with that. But here are some, some things you can think about where we're applying this or thinking this through should lead you to. Here's the first one. Um, repent and believe in Christ. So if you don't know Christ, you are still a part of God's redemptive plan, right? You are still living in the reality of this world. And unless you repent and believe in Christ and receive the forgiveness of sins that is in him, it is ordained for you to perish in eternity in hell. That's what will happen to all who do not believe Christ. And so in coming to understand God's sovereignty, realize that he is your creator. He is your maker. He, he does own you. And he has revealed himself to you. He has revealed himself to you in Christ. And he revealed that he wants you to come to Christ in repentant faith to believe in him and be saved and be redeemed and receive the inheritance that he gives to all who believe in him. 
And so the first application is repent and believe in Christ. The second is, is for us who are believers, it's be committed and courageous in the purposes of the church. Be committed and courageous in the purposes of the church. Share the gospel with people. Make disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciple somebody. Pursue ministry in the church to help others be more like Christ. And I know many of you are doing this. I'm just saying, be. this is what God is doing. You, you understand that. Christ is building his church. Nothing is going to overcome that. And the best thing that we can do with our lives is live our lives for Christ's purposes. They are eternal purposes. They are everlasting purposes. What we do for Christ will last forever. The empires that men build in this life are not going to last forever. But the kingdom of God will. And so when it comes to the church, when it comes to the people in the church, be bold, be courageous, be committed and pursue those. And here's the third application. Be humble and trust God. Be humble and trust God. Be humble and submit to God. How do you be humble and trust God? Well, be humble and submit to God, James 1, 2 to 5. When James speaks about trials that we all face, it talks about letting endurance have its perfect results so that you might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So that idea of letting endurance is that idea of just submitting to the weight of the trial. Again, um, mum more so than me, but obviously I'm wrapped up in it. We're in the midst of a trial. We're trying to get out. (laughs) We can't, and it seems to just be going one way. But we trust God with that. And while we're under that trial, we, we are being humble and we are praying. We're trying to be humble and pray. That's the other thing. Be humble and submit to God. Be humble and, and pray to God. First uh, Peter chapter 5. Look, look with me there. And this, remember, in First Peter is the context of, of, of God's providence, God's sovereignty over the suffering that believers are facing. And in First Peter chapter 5 verse 6, he says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. How do you humble yourself? You cast your anxiety on God. The things that are concerning you, you pray to God about. You make your supplications to Him. But you also confess your sin to Him. In your prayers, you adore Him. You still praise Him. And also, you give your thanksgiving to Him. Remember, be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, make your request to God. I've I've probably paraphrased it a little bit, but you get the idea. And so when it comes to God's providence, we humble ourselves and we trust God. We we submit to his sovereignty in our lives, to those circumstances that he's placed on us. We, We pray to God. We cry out to him. We tell him about what's going on. We ask him for things. Here's another one. We we obey God's word. Humbling ourselves means we obey his word. The things that God has called us to do, we do. Um, There's specific applications, again, to the trial that that we're facing that we believe God has called us to do. And, and, And if you want to know what that is, come and talk to me about it later. I'd rather not share it online. But but as you're facing certain things, what is God calling you to do? Maybe like Joseph, it's to forgive somebody. Maybe someone has wronged you and harmed you, and they've come to you in repentance. Like Joseph's brothers did, what should you do? You should forgive them, right? Because that's what God calls you to do. You may find that difficult and hard, but God will give you the grace to do that. But when you understand even God's providence, even in their own sin in your life, it enables you to forgive that perpetrator even as Joseph was able to forgive his brothers because he saw the grander picture of what was going on. And finally, in this application of of humbling yourself and trusting God, humble yourself and submit to him, humble yourself and pray to him, humble yourself and obey him, uh, humble yourself and, and praise God. Job did that. Remember, he'd lost everything. 
and his response was the Lord gives and the Lord takes us away blessed be the name of the Lord and in all this he did not sin against God it's a lot to take in I know but let me leave you with this to what end or purpose does God uphold all things this is a quote it is to the praise of his glory it is to the praise of his glory though what God does in his providence benefits us its highest virtue is found in its glorification of God himself God's upholding of his creation reflects upon his own glory And that glory is not a divine vice, but is the highest possible good. If God was centered on something less than himself, that focus would reflect a defeat in himself and render him less than God and unworthy of our worship. It is a sweet and excellent paradox that God's provision for his creatures and his upholding of his creation is also the manifestation of his eternal glory. Calvin remarked about this when he wrote first then let the reader remember that the providence we mean is not one by which the deity sitting idly in heaven looks on at what is taking place in the world but one by which he as it were holds the helm and overrules all events hence his providence extends not less to the hand than to the eye that is to say he not only sees but ordains what he wills to be done In these works of providence, the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy is made manifest. As you grasp more the providence of God, as you wrestle with it through in your own life, may you see that. May you see the glory and the majesty of God as the sovereign ruler of all creation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, We just thank you for your word, um, which page after page after page reveals you to be the sovereign creator, the sustainer, the governor, the ruler, the upholder of, of all your creation. That, Lord, nothing happens outside of your sovereign control. And, Lord, we wrestle with that, being finite beings. We wrestle with a God who is both transcendent and imminent, present actively working Father we we wrestle with those things in our hearts and minds more so with some circumstances than others but Lord your word is so clear to us you are in control and Lord there's such a a blessing, there's such a relief there's such a joy a contentment a safety to trust in you in that to submit to you in that to know that Lord you will work or you are working all things according to the counsel of your will and Lord you have revealed that to us we, we know the end that those who have entrusted in Christ who are redeemed will share the inheritance with Christ when all things are brought under his rule and Lord those who refuse to bow the knee to Christ those who will not repent Lord, they will be cast out of his kingdom into outer darkness. So, Lord, we pray that your providence would really stir within our own hearts. Lord, you know the areas that we need to grow in. Father, you know how we need to apply this wonderful truth, fearsome truth, but a wonderful truth. And, Lord, may your spirit do that in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.